Hello everybody, my name is Rodgon. I'm an artist, designer, teacher, mentor, and everything in between, and today we will draw together. So go grab your sketchbooks, get excited, because even if you're not excited, I'm going to teach you how to draw better without the need of motivation today. I'm going to teach you the ways that I learned how to do this, and how it was pretty much forced upon me because I was not a naturally talented artist. So I had to by just definition, be able to compete with other people without requiring my motivation. So, so what, what accumulates to being able to draw without uh, motivation? Like, when we don't have inspiration, how do we draw energy from our creative like, sections to be able to get past that? Well, motivation, in my opinion, motivation is not important to me why why is it not important because it's my job right this is my career so in order for this to not be a hobby i need to put extra steps in order to be able to create this the problem is that our jobs are artistic, right? So we kind of feed off motivation and inspiration, which could be the same thing. Motivation and inspiration uh, to create art. And without it, we often do not understand or know how to create the artistic process if you can't imagine something really cool in your mind or you can't think of a cool idea. Well, the thing is, if you are a person that has to wait for inspiration to create art, it's going to be very difficult for you to have a job in the art world because employers are not going to wait for you to get motivated to create work for them. Right. So this is something that we tell ourselves a lot in like art school and in like our learning curve. Like while we're learning, we tell ourselves that, oh, my motivation carries me through everything. When I'm motivated and inspired, I can do anything. But we don't realize how much we're actually doing without motivation. Right. All your homeworks, all your uh, assignments, all your lessons, all that stuff normally comes from just you knowing that you have to accomplish a task. Right. It's not necessarily motivation, but that's also giving you artistic prowess. Like you're learning a different skill set. You're learning a different tool. You're learning a different like ability. You're learning some other new weapon that you can use in your arsenal. And, you know, like so that you are like completely awesomely like prepared for war. When it comes down to like tackling any art situation that you need to. Uh, excuse my lack of knowledge in military helmets. So every single tool that you learn. So digital art is a tool. Right? Digital art in general is created with computers and you now Photoshop and stuff like that. Those are all tools, right? If you know how to use those tools, your world just widened a shit ton. So digital drawing, but it, it's not like you should not categorize yourself as a digital artist, right? That is not that's not smart, right? If you categorize yourself as like a graphic designer or an animator. You're, you're, you're missing the point here. Like, why segment yourself to just a little tiny piece of the pie, of the pie, right? Just because you spent three years learning animation doesn't mean that you're not going to learn graphic design, interior design, fashion, marketing, advertising, and everything in between as well. See, the thing is, I don't understand, okay, and Broise says, I don't understand art school class when they don't let you develop your style and push realism. The thing is, when someone comes into, let me explain to you why, why teachers do this, okay? Let me explain to you why they don't let you pursue your own style 
and why they miss the mark most of the time when it comes down to this point. The thing is, we talked about this earlier too. I think we have it somewhere. Let me see if I have it handy. If I have it handy, I will show it to you guys. Perfect. All right, so we talked about this a couple days ago and I haven't uploaded this to YouTube, but it was like the best art lesson in the fucking world, right? It took me like 30 minutes to give it and it's just like the best explanation as to how you learn and how you stop learning. So stage one, you learn how to draw basic shapes and you learn how to draw with materials. That's your basic stage of learning. Stage two, you start associating those shapes with objects like houses, people, trees, suns, stuff like that. And then stage three is where we stuck. We get stuck. This is where we all get stuck. The reason that we get stuck here is because this is the stage where we start taking this and we start putting style to it, right? We start putting style just to make things look pretty. So this stage can last forever. You can have a whole professional career at this stage. I did. I was 15 years deep into my career before I changed and I learned that I did not know shit. Anyways, this stage is just when we start associating styles with what we draw. This is where we normally get stuck. And the reason that they teach you not to draw in your style is because they're trying to break you out of this shit into the next stage. They're trying to make you see things differently. They're trying to make you see things that are going to really open up the art world. Because this, learning the extra shit, learning the fundamentals, and excluding style. Fuck style. Style is just something that you add at the end. Like something that you just develop by knowing and understanding anatomy and then breaking that anatomy in a way that makes more fun sense to you. Right? You want a robot with an eye? Okay, cool. That's just an eyeball with a robot eye part. It's the same thing as just this eye. I can do break and control any style once you understand this. A lot of people that study animation will be brought into this side of the world of the art just naturally because this is something that's basic within our animation background. Right? So this gives you a stupidly strong heads up on anyone then it comes down to drawing so the thing is a lot of us think that we know this we think that we we are experts at it we think that we understand this and then we have like an issue drawing a leg or we have an issue drawing an ear on the other side it's because you don't understand this you think you understand this but you don't really comprehend it or actively apply it to what you draw. Where is your view on tracing versus referencing when it comes to big corporate traced? See, if you are basing yourself off what big corporations do, then you're never going to create awesome stuff. The most lazy designs that I have ever done in my life have come from when I worked at t-shirt designs. This will be on YouTube. It's already streaming on YouTube, so it's going to be there then. So when you're doing t-shirt designs, you got to do like 50 designs a week or something like that. That's normally between a team, but, you know, places don't account for people like me that can draw a stupid amount of things really, really quick. That job... Even though I created a stupid amount of art for it, like really, really fun, silly art, it was just lazy art because you didn't have the time to sit down and draw what you wanted. You didn't have the time to or the, the budget to do that. So again, this leads to this too. When you are hired as a designer and you got to do like 50 designs in a week, let's say I want 50 ninjas comprised of 25 for teens and 25 for babies right? You got to do then 50 designs with ninjas. Yeah. And then puns and silly, like whatever, like, you know, a pizza ninja. Yay. Uh, crap like this is eaten up by everyone. So the thing is, 
it takes no motivation after you draw your first 20 ninjas to just come up with a different shape for the ninja and then like something like a lazy ninja at this point like Bleh. right Bleh. or like one that like got stabbed or something for the teenagers i don't know but it's weird man like the world of production art is really weird like it's not always it's not tracing but it's literally like taking other people's like ideas and then pushing them for your company like pushing their styles or whatever like popular thing is popular and then just branding that with your style and that's what production companies do that's what most jobs that give you a t-shirt design job or something like that are going to ask you to do right it's not very rarely it's going to be design your own cool t-shirt that's like oh man this is your own character awesome let's draw him in the t-shirt and let's push that now they'll be like okay well how can we take uh, the supreme logo and apply our version of that uh rug on. yeah it's red and white yeah let's print that that's the type of shit that you're gonna get if you want to do something cool with your art, you need to start your own brand. And, you know, you, again, don't require motivation to do this. This is, okay, I'm just going to give you guys the bare, like, straight up way to get rid of that shit. Okay? If you don't want to be motivated to draw, pick up a sketchbook, a big sketchbook. Let's make this a challenge. Pick up a a fat sketchbook, like a new sprint sketchbook so it's cheap, right? So for like 10 bucks, pick up a big, fat, ridiculous new sprint sketchbook. Spend one week of your life, an entire week, filling that up with as many drawings of everything that you see around you. Everything. This is going to take you a considerable amount of time. If it's a thick enough sketchbook, let's say like a hundred, maybe a hundred and eighty page sketchbook, right? Divided by seven, that's eighteen by seven. That's it's like two and a half weeks. If you divide it, you can probably do that in two and a half weeks by doing how many pages a day? Or that's twenty two and a half pages a day? No, that's not it. Somebody do the math for me. I'm not. I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> I think it's like 14 pages a day, isn't it? God, I suck at math. Let's see. 180 divided by seven. There you go. All right, so that's 25 pages a day. Let's say that you do it in two weeks. That's only 12.5 pages a day. If you can do this, we used to call it our one week sketchbook. Right? That was the challenge. One week sketchbooks. We used to have 200 page sketchbooks. 200 page sketchbooks from Borders. They were like this fucking thick. They were ridiculously. Right? So, we didn't know how to draw. Like, we really did not know how to draw. Like, the people at our art school were not really trained how to draw. So if you even drew a little bit good, you were like, God. You're like, la. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh you didn't have to. Oh, man. Thank you. Right? That's how you feel whenever you are a person that knows how to draw in an art school. And that should not be the case because everybody should know how to draw to a certain extent. But in our school, since they mostly focus on 3D animation, they thought that they didn't need to teach us how to draw. But what ended up happening was that we were all just creating awesome 3D models out of shitty drawings. So it was like, uh, what's the point? Because you come up with a shitty end result anyways. So let me explain to you guys what happens when you do this. If you manage, if you manage to do this, 
and not cheat yourself by like drawing like one little drawing in a page, right? Like, eh, I filled it up, or let me draw something really big. <laughs> it's filled. No, no, no. Don't fucking don't, don't cheat yourself. This is your career. This is your career. If you really want to get better, like, do it right, right? Fill it in. Try to like, get as much realty space as you can, and then start using the in between spaces to come up with different ways of creating things, right? If you can find a way to draw a face within like a weird squiggly shape like that, maybe you can come up with like different head shapes later. Like you never know, you never know what you're going to be able to come up with when you eliminate like a systematic approach to it, right? The next thing that I need you guys to start thinking about is abstract sketching. What is abstract sketching? What the fuck is that, right? So abstract sketching is the type of exercises that we do where we don't really think about what we're going to draw. We draw random shit, and then you see what you can make with that. Right? You start looking at things, and then you start coming up with cool concepts, mostly due to you being able to see it like a Rorschach's test. Right? Taking a random abstract shape and then creating something from it. In this case, I'm making like a professional speed, like Walker or something. Or like a space cadet. Right? So the concept of abstract sketching absolves the need for motivational drawing. So if you never feel if you don't feel like you're drawing something important, just draw a random doodle and then see what you can come up with from that. Right? That triggers your your like, brain activity. This is going to let you like think of different things that maybe you weren't thinking about. Like this guy looks like a taxi cab driver. Right? That has like a big chin. And this is not out of the reach and grasp. It's, this is not because I am magically like talented people. This is not because I am like incredibly so absurdly like gifted that only I can do this shit. No, the reason that I teach you guys is because this is accessible to everybody. This is something that everybody can learn, but it's not easy and you need to step away from step three. Okay? Step away from stage three. Learn your perspective, your foundations. And what I consider your foundations are three things. Perspective. And not perspective like grids and shit. No subdividing of shapes and visualizing them from the top, bottom, and sides. That's all you need to do. You don't need to learn how to do it as a visual like guide in a fucking background. Start with this. Just start drawing circles and then trace little lines over them. Whee! Right? If you can do that, you're already set. Do the thing with boxes. Just make a random boxy shape and then subdivide that. And then See if it looks good. We, if it does, perfect. Now that gives you a grid to draw on. So now you can draw evenly because you have a grid. And you know where your things are. It's not that hard of a concept, right? Slowly you transition from doing these simple shapes to slightly more complex shapes. And then this is where the second foundation happens, which is overlapping shapes, right? You combine two shapes and then you start seeing how they overlap. How they overlap. What happens when you like twist them? And little by little, your brain starts developing foreshortening. Right? Your brain's slowly gonna develop foreshortening naturally. Because now you're gonna be able to take this and you're gonna be able to be like, okay, well, a beanbag and a beanbag and a beanbag equals an arm. A beanbag into a beanbag into another beanbag equals a leg. 
and they're all overlapping, so I already know where they're supposed to go. This, this leads to this, but you need to understand anatomy. If you don't understand a little bit of anatomy, your drawings are going to look very fake. Or even if you do manage to create like really cool cartoon characters, you might not know why the little bumps happen in the body or the little lumps or the little things that stick out, right? All those little things that happen in our body happen because of our anatomy. Our rib cage, our hard surfaces, our bones, our tendons, all that stuff, applying this knowledge to it gives you stuff like this, right? Understanding anatomy allows you to understand, for example, like the three parts of the eye and how you can manipulate that to create different styles, different looks, different feelings. So the more you understand anatomy and the more you understand perspective gives you the access to everything. Everything. Style just becomes something you add on top of your structure. It's not going to be... Like, oh, I need to find my style. It'll be like, okay, what style do I want to apply to this today? Right? Can you sketch a basic bedroom layout at some point? Maybe with... <laughs> are you asking me to do your homework? Or are you asking me to, like, do a project that you have due? Is that what you're trying to do? All right. We'll, we'll sketch a one-point perspective layout real fast. Let's do, like, a little quick storyboard panel. Okay? So let's say that we have this. So without a perspective grid, the first thing that I'm going to draw is my bed because that's going to be the highlight of the room. So I want it to look nicely on the, on the frame. So I'm just going to find a nice little perspective for it. I'm not considering a grid or anything at this point, right? So I'm going to have my bed. I'm going to have some pillows on it. Maybe a poster or something like that, a bed stand. Right? Maybe a blanket that has like texture. So now that we have this, maybe a night light. Now that I have this much of my scene, I can do the rest of the room by finding exactly where my horizon lines are. So now that I have this bed, I can figure out my horizon line is going to be up there, uh, probably up here. So that's going to be my horizon line. So I can make my room incredibly large for that bed. Or I can just literally just cap it and then just start coming up with uh, the rest of the points from that perspective. And then anything on the walls can go to that point of perspective. You know? Stuff like anything that you're going to have outside of your main like drawing, now you can have as a element perspective. But you didn't start with the grid, so you didn't have to find it that intimidating. At this point, it's literally just you drawing your elements that you want with proper like you know viewing angle and then figuring out the rest from that point of view, since this is going to be your focal point. Just a different approach to things, you know? Like, not everything has to be approached the same way. The same reason that not everything has to be drawn the same way. Okay, so I wasn't wrong. I've been practicing and just wasn't all that confident. Thank you. Yeah. I am looking for tips on anime drawing. Anime is just a style. Anime is just a style, right? It's not like an eye like a normal eye and an anime eye. I don't know what you would consider an anime eye, maybe something like this, right? The only difference between these is the design look of the eye and the way that you draw your eyelash around your eye. For a more traditional look, you would draw it just going around, right? Maybe not so thick of a line, a little bit of lines for your anatomy, for your lip line, Blah, blah, blah. Right? Something like this would be like a traditional just comic book eye, pin-up eye, whatever. An anime eye, 
it's still the same thing. It's still wrapping around the shape, but it's going to be more angled. Right? It's going to be more exaggerated. You're going to have like ridiculous eyelashes. But the eyelashes are the same. They're wrapping around your sphere. Right? They're wrapping around your sphere. It's only doing it at a in a boxy way. The little like all these little eyelets and shit like that that you see, it's just the thickness of the eyelash. That's what you're that's what you're drawing. The bottom's the same way. You can just exaggerate it if you want. Blah 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 blah. You can have the big super kawaii like eyes as well. Right? So anime is just a style. That's why they tell you not to draw an anime. Because you're not learning the foundations. You're learning how to stylize. They're trying to break you out of that so that you can open up your eyes and your brain so you understand that you can draw this if you learn the basic shit first. <laughs> They're not trying to like hinder your style they're not trying to be like oh don't be creative they're telling you fucking learn first and then be creative that's what you're going to school for i would literally just buy a book of your sketches oh my god if i wasn't broke uh, i might be releasing some ebooks with uh some inspiration books i'm gonna call them art blocks and then whenever i get them printed i have some stuff to take to conventions as well So, yeah, anatomy is important perspective in the way of uh, just knowing how to break your objects down in different ways, like cutting them or cutting into them with negative space or extruding parts from them, like horns and shit tails, noses, crap like this, dude, like, these exercises, right, these, like these, the ones that I just did right now, these are what allow you to draw this easy, but nobody ever does these, nobody, nobody spends their time, like, going, like, doody doo dee doo 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 I'm gonna draw a box, I'm gonna draw a hole in my box, doo 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 Oh, I'm going to draw a nose on this side of the box. Bop, 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 bop. Like, nobody does this because it's boring. Right? It doesn't have a gratifying thing at the end. You don't end up with a cool sketch page. But at the end of the day, learning how to draw a head from the bottom is not hard when you learn that the face is just a box. Knowing where the eyes fall... It's not hard because the top is just a box that has a cutout, right? We forget to apply what we learn to what we're drawing because we're so heavily concentrated on style. So that's what happens. That's why they tell you not to. That's why they tell you not to draw in your own peculiar style that probably has a shit ton of anatomy mistakes. And you probably don't understand how to draw something without stylizing. Like, I tell people, if you can't draw me a basic hand, just a basic, just really simple basic hand, right? If you can't draw this, don't stylize it. Spend a, a week practicing, learning, figuring out what the different parts of the hand are, the little bumps, the bones how much distance are from here you have hands on you you can draw them from your own reference right there's nothing keeping you from just sitting down and drawing hands all day and making mental notes and being like okay well how why does this not make sense to me how can i make it make sense how can i make the little webbing make sense to me see the way that i did it it's like i thought about this as a chicken breast like like a drumstick right so that gives me my drumstick, gives me my thumb and my little part inside, right? I know that next to this part, there's a little squishy part over here, which I consider like the mashed potatoes or something, right? And I just consider this like a dinner plate. 
where things are not supposed to touch. So my knuckle line. So this is how I envision shit. So because I spent hours just drawing it the other way that people were doing it, like I spent many an hour drawing hands from boxes. Right? With their cylinder shit. And then it always came out super boxy because I'm drawing a goddamn box, right? They don't tell you that the hand has curvature, right? They don't tell you that the hand angles and they twist and it actually has like a little pivot part between your bone and your wrist, right? Like they don't teach you this shit because it's hard to explain. And when people find it hard to do, they just give up. And therefore, people that do teach people like they're supposed to don't end up getting, uh, you know, like book deals or course deals and shit like that. Mostly because even though they're giving you better information, it's not easy to digest. You know, so being a teacher and, you know, being able to explain these things to you in a way that makes a little bit more sense is very very humbling and i actually find it very very cool to be able to just explain things in a way that makes sense to you because this is the way that it made sense to me right i like to draw my hands more like potato chips like a pringles right because it gives me my little palm part it gives me like if I draw my knuckle right there, that gives me the bottom of my hand, the top of my hand, because the, the hand is only as wide as your knuckle. If you do not know this and you have never looked at your hand, look at this. This is the bottom part of the knuckle, right? This little squishy part. That's the top of it. That's the bottom of it. So my hand is only as wide as my knuckle. My entire hand. It's only really as wide as my knuckle. Maybe a little wider here because of the little squishy part. But if I draw my knuckle, I already know the bottom and the top of it. Then if I find my middle finger, I know that to this side there's one finger, right? And there's only one finger to the left, and then there's two fingers on the other side. So if I find my middle finger, one finger to this side, two fingers to that side. The fingers have so much flexibility and range of movement that it's so just silly to think that they have this. So I don't like doing that. I just like drawing the digits at first, like the, the upper part, wherever they're going to be doing whatever they're doing. Let's say you're grabbing something right here. right, And then I figure out how to connect that part of the finger to the rest of the hand. Let's do some more. So we find our knuckle underneath our potato chip to give us the width of our hand. Right? Then we have our fingers are going to go from this knuckle to the first section. These two sections right here are going to be the same distance as the next two together. So these two, these two. So we split that one. So we make our knuckle. It goes into our palm, right? Our knuckle doesn't start up here. No, no, no. Our knuckles inside of our palm, okay? Inside. Not outside. Uh -uh. Inside. The reason that your fingers might look really long is because if you're taking the measurements from here, you're extending it by like half a finger's width. So from here to the first knuckle is going to be the same distance as the next two together. From here to the first knuckle, it's going to be about the same distance as there to the next one. So that is 
a very easy way to measure out your hands and your knuckles for your for your upper like for your hand for your thumb once you have this little potato chip you create Imagine that you're either drawing like a drumstick or you're drawing like a stick shift car. If you're thinking about a stick shift car, boom, boom, boom. You know the little wiggle part? That's, that's it. That's your knuckle line. And then you have a little palm part on the side, right? That just matches this. Connects to your wrists. But that's how you have to see it. Because this moves a lot. This moves a shit ton. Like there's a ton of flexibility when it comes down to your thumb. Right? It can range all the way from in here to out there. Right? So there's so much range that you can't just like be like, okay, well, think about it as like a little triangle. No, you, you can't. You got to think about it as a three-dimensional shape that has a path. Right? So you need this into the knuckle into, and that's how you would translate that to like a real representation. Of it. Could you talk about drawing skulls? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, just give me a second though. Let me take a drink from my cup that my apprentice gave me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then all playing back to what our initial theme was right when you learn how to do all this like normally when we need inspiration is because we're so focused on a certain style that we require somebody else's vision or something else to trigger that inspiration side of us we require to look at something cool so that we can draw our own version of that, right? Or something similar to that to inspire, oh my God, like this, oh, then maybe I can do this. That's because we're so focused on creating our own style, right? You're so focused on copying style that you have uh, relinquished your ability to think for yourself, to motivate yourself, to understand that creativity comes from inside of you, not from an external source. Right? We don't think every day when we wake up, we're not like, oh, my God, I'm going to copy what Disney did. No, we're like, oh, shit, we're going to tackle the world. We're going to show the world of ideas. We're going to like, I'm going to bust out my comic today. I'm going to do a poster. I'm going to do a pinup. I'm going to do a cartoon. I'm going to do my web comic. I'm going to tell the story. I'm going to write my script. I'm going to take my photos. I'm going to do my photo shoot. I'm going to do my cosplay shoot. Right. Like, that's, that's what we wake up thinking. We don't think, like, oh, well, I, was, I just want to do what somebody else did. Okay, so let's talk about skulls, because that's going to be the most important part right now. I think that's a valuable lesson, and I think that relating that to this is going to explain a lot why you require perspective and a little bit of anatomy knowledge whenever you're drawing. So it relates to it perfectly. So what is a head? How do we draw a skull from just like a drawing that we did like a head from? So what are the major parts of our face? Let's draw a face. Let's just draw a basic head of somebody, right? I'm just going to draw Mr. Generic Rod right here. Mr. Generic Rod is going to have some features in his face that he's going to help us by pointing out. Hello, Mr. Rod. All right, Mr. Rod right here is Mr. Generic Stan, right? And that's what we call our generic people here, Stans. So if your name is Stan, I'm sorry, I don't mean to uh, insult you. <laughs> it's just the way that I call my generic things. So Mr. Stan here has a couple things happening in his face. How do we know what we are drawing and how to like manipulate it so we can do caricatures and character design a lot better? Well, the first step is identifying this as a basic skull, right? Like we need to understand what parts of the skull are being shown in order for us to be able to design this differently. First 
thing that I always like to reference is this little dip right here. Right? Whenever you are drawing, that dip is very prevalent in a lot of styles. It's prevalent in anime. It's prevalent in comic book, like, you know, like Marvel and like DC, like, whoa. They always have like super heavy, like, set in stuff. Right? Martha! Martha! Why is your head on? But that dip is just your eye socket. So your eye socket curves into your body from your forehead line. So you have your forehead line, which is going to be your eyebrow line, essentially. Right? Then it goes into your eye socket, and the curvature out is your cheekbone. This curvature right here is your cheekbone. Now, whatever distance from here to your chin, right, from there to there, it's going to be whatever, like if your cheeks are really big, you would have a bigger cheek because your cheek mass would be right there. If you're skinny or like really fit, you would see a lot less of that. But on this side of the face, it's normally just the cheek to the chin. There's no jawbone there. Your jaw is actually inside of here because your ear is back here. So your jaw actually curves in like that. Right? On this side of the face, the points that you see are your jawbone, your temple, and the side of your face. Here, this is a part where a lot of people have issues with. Now, you might notice that uh, Mr. Stan's eyes right here are much smaller than my eye socket, and that's because your eyes are much smaller than your eye socket. Your eyeball is inside of that eye socket, right? That eye socket creates shadows because it's sunken in because of your bone right here. This bone creates a shadow or a crevice like a cup with a ball inside. Learn how to do this and you won't need to learn how to draw heads from the top. I promise you that. Like, learn how to just follow along with what I'm doing right now, and heads up are just gonna become something easy for you to do. So, once you learn the concept of this being an eye socket that has negative space that goes in, then things like shadows here make sense, right? Because the light is hitting here. Ba -ba blocking it and then going in a, to a shadow because of that little dip. So normally that's why we have shadows right there. Now the next thing that we need to learn is what happens with our nose and our mouth and stuff like that. Well in this case his nose is relatively large but it's a little bit underneath his mouth. So around our cheekbone we can go around our cheekbone and come up with our nose canal. Our nose canal has a little break that goes forward and creates our little nose cavity. This break right here is the same as here, right? It's the same as here, so it's going to be always right in the middle of the eyes most of the time, unless you change it. Unless you decide to change it, it should probably be around there. So in the middle of our face, we get a little shape that looks more like a mask. If we want to simplify all this into something simple, it's something like this. You know where to put your eyeballs. And you know where your nose is going to come out from. 
So this is why I simplify it into a mask. So I can get all my anatomical like placement really quickly. The one day I get to bring my sketchbook to school, bro. Oh, well, you can always just uh, watch this again later on whenever you're home and then just uh, watch it on YouTube. I see you've done hands a lot, but what's the tip about making them less stiff? And Oh, change the shape of them. Like, use rounder shapes. Like, and take the knowledge of anatomy that I just taught you to play around with the flow of it. Right? Stop making them into boxes and start moving your fingers around like your fingers are incredibly flexible right like test the limits on your drawings like l let me give you a basic exercise that you can do that you can just get really good at moving fingers okay take this drawing if i move my finger this way does it look right I think it it could possibly be there. If I move it here, does it look right? Nope, that looks broken. Uh-uh. Does it look right if I move it here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's go to the thumb. If I move my thumb this way, does it look right? If I move it this way, does it look right? Uh, it's starting to look really weird. How about here? How about into perspective? What? How far back? How can I test the limits? How do you find different hand shapes? By taking your movement and applying it to your actual drawings whenever you can. And just to test to see how far you can bend those limbs. That's what you do. And you learn by trial and error. So, okay, that one doesn't look right, but this one does. So, if I wanted to draw a super cartoony hand, now I know that I can extend that thumb up to a certain amount. And it's going to look okay. Even if it's the most simple rudimentary hand. But if I push it past that point, it's just going to look really weird. Test your limits with your drawings, especially when you're just practicing in your sketchbook. Okay, so let's go back to schools. So we have, boop, 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 we have our eye socket we, we talked about, and then we have our eyeball, and we talked about the eyeball just being like showing the eyelid, right? So I'm going to draw the middle of my eye first. Then I'm going to draw my eyelid, if I, depending on the style and the mood that I want. For example, if a person's tired, I would draw the eyelid a lot more closed than I would somebody that's really excited, right? So just to average it out to uh, this guy, we're gonna draw the eyelid right here. And then we're gonna draw the uh, bottom eyelid like that. Showing a little bit of the bottom eyelid because you would still see a little bit in the top. Perfect. Now the nose, just comes out of this area so he has a little teardrop nose I'm gonna take the top of this trace that and do a teardrop shape I'm new how do you start them who's Pete no I'm not gonna be drawing characters you can learn how to draw all your favorite cartoon characters from a quadrillion people on YouTube so you can go follow fan art there Whenever I do fan art, it's normally to draw them doing something fun, like being tattooed or something. Like that. I'm not in the habit of just drawing people things that they feel like they want to get drawn. How do you draw from different angles? Okay. Um, I think that I need just to reiterate it again. When you learn how to draw a sphere and you learn this basic exercise, right? When you learn this basic exercise, drawing from different angles is as easy as just tracing your shapes 
in a different angle. If you can't do this yet, if you can't figure out how to do this yet, for the love of God, stop drawing stylized shit and then just start drawing things like this. Learn the very basics of drawing through your shape so you have ears, jaws, and everything, and then just learn the concept of drawing in 3D space, okay? Like, the question is not silly, the question is not ridiculous, but you can't skip steps and expect to understand what you're drawing, right? You can probably draw something really fucking cool, man. Like, I promise you, you probably can draw something amazing. But if you can't understand the concept of just rotating a face because it's hard, then you need to go back to your basics and you need to establish that. You need to make that solid. Yes, I understand that you mean the head. Uh, I just got a ball and draw the lines on it and then turn the ball around. Yeah, no, that's all you really need to do. You All you need to do is create circles and spheres and then rotate them. That's the same thing for like learning how to draw eyes in different positions, right? Like learn to draw them in different shapes, different positions by just drawing a lot of them on actual little balls. But actually apply that to your drawings. Like don't just do exercises. Like so many people go like do like the little exercises like this, right? Like they're like, yeah, yeah, I can fill up entire pages of this shit. Yeah, yeah. And then like, but I don't know how to draw an eye. An eye is just a sphere. So apply what you learn. Don't just draw for drawing sake, right? Just drawing for drawing sake, like just doesn't get you any progress. It doesn't make you any better. It just makes you draw more. It just makes you tired. How about that? Uh, let's prop this up a little bit again. There you go. Cool. Does that look better? Yeah, I think so. All right, so we were talking about the head. So. Once you understand where our nose is supposed to come out of, because of our nose little pocket, and we draw the nose first because the nose sometimes covers a little bit of the mouth. I like to draw the mouths in two different ways. I have learned to draw them like, <laughs> this is going to sound silly, but I've learned to draw them like an angry cyclops or like a cyclops. So I draw my mouths like eyes that are angry cyclops. And then I just put the negative space in, right? That is how I've been learning to draw them more recently. So I really like it because the top lid, the eyelid of the of the thing would be just the curvature of the muscle up top. And then the lower eyelid would just be the curvature of the muscle underneath. So I love that. I love thinking about it like that because it just makes sense to me. Right. Another way that you can think about it, though, is uh, a simpler approach, which is like a rubber band approach. You can draw a rubber band, flatten the sides, and then add negative space. And that normally tends to work relatively well in many different styles and stuff. <coughs> negative space. Pew, pew, pew. Uh. Okay, so that's normally like the things. Then when you go up here, let me explain to you guys what happens here. This curvature comes from the chin down to the jaw. And you guys might be wondering, how do you know when to curve it up? Well, the curvature only curves up after your teeth are done. Right where your back molars are, that's when it starts curling up. And it goes into your cheekbone, by the way. So at the end of your teeth, curve it up. It also doesn't curve up straight up, right? It doesn't go straight up on your face like that. Well, like, let me see, like that. It goes up at an angle. Your jaw comes up at an angle 
your teeth. So they come out in an angle, which makes it easier to align with the bottom part of your teeth. If you always have it down, your teeth are going to be all the way back here. So you're going to have a gigantic mouth. And it's always going to look a little weird. Push that line forward so that your teeth line, your curvature right here, doesn't end up taking up like half your drawing. Then from there, your neck connects to the back of your ear. And we get our neck. The temple comes at the top of the eyebrow line. Boom, 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 boom. I hit 90k. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. Woohoo! Let's do 100k before the end of the year. Let's break 100,000. All right, so when you're drawing quickly and you're just trying to apply those to different things, let's just do a couple different heads, okay? Let's see, yeah. Let's do a couple different heads. So we are going to apply the mask technique to each one of these in different fashions. Like we'll change it up a little bit too. There you go. Cool. So this is going to apply the same principles that we talked about, but in different styles, okay? So this one, let's make this into like, I don't know, this guy seems like he has high cheekbones. Mm -hmm. Same concepts, I'm applying this angry cyclops for the mouth. The muscle comes underneath the nose and then everything connects to the chin. The eyeballs are supposed to be within my mask right so i know that one eyeball has to be here one eyeball can be here too and then i'm going to decide i'm making him a villain so i'm going to give him like an angry face we decided that this part is going to be shaded if the eyes are going to be sunken in so we're going to sunk in his eyes a little bit because the eye socket is going to be more prominent the cheekbone is going to be right there, giving me the little curvature back to my forehead line. My forehead line is going to give me my eyebrows. And my eyebrows are going to give me my temples and the side of my head. Cool. So let's apply that to a completely different style. Uh, we're going to start with. Um, I don't know. We can start from anywhere. Let's start with a really cool, like, gorilla's top eyes. Okay. From here, we can, if we determine that this is where we want our eyebrows, great. If we want to change that line, we can always change that line, too. Let's make a really weird one. Let's make a one eyebrow down, one eyebrow up. Okay. At the end of the mask, that's normally where your ears are as well. So that's another measurement that you can get from it. Your temples come from the side of your side eyebrows. So I know that my reference is going to be right there. And then let's draw a super cartoony rubber band mouth. Knowing where my skeleton is, so I know that my cheekbones are here. So then, therefore, my teeth have to be around here because they would curve in and they would curve in this way. So I know my teeth are supposed to be there. My bottom jaw seems to be a lot bigger than normal, right? It's widening a lot. So, therefore, my teeth are going to go extra wide up until the curvature that goes up here. This would be hitting my cheekbone, so it would create a curvature in. And then you could apply whatever styling you want. Now let's go with a super silly, happy one. So my nose coming out of my nose canal. We're going to simplify the mouth a lot, but we're still going to keep it within the constraints. 
right? This would be more for like a character logo, for like an insurance company character, or whatever. Animation style. So it can be applied to many different ways of viewing. It's just a matter of applying a style at the end whenever you are satisfied with how your drawing looks. It can be applied to female characters as well. Just as easy. This is how I draw my pinups. Right. It's the same concept of landmarks and stuff. So it's a matter of understanding the concept of the shapes so that you can therefore break out of those rules and create your own styling. That is how you create your own styles. That is how you make up your own ways. It comes through understanding. If you don't understand it, at one point you might come up with a really cool style. Yeah, there's nothing stopping you from progressing without understanding this shit. But doing so forward, going forward, doing so, understanding that there's a different path that might get you better results, continuing on with our ego boost of not thinking outside the box is no longer going to be permitted. Or it's just not going to be like acceptable for you, right? Because you know now that there's so much more out there that you can get, so much more that you can achieve. So... I highly suggest that you spend the time to practice, play around with this concept until it clicks. And then once it does click, it never leaves you. It never leaves, right? This is more, like even more than riding a bike. Once you are actually able to see this, it will never leave. You'll be 90 blind and still be able to draw like this. Um... <sighs> Can you show the key differences between drawing a male and a female character? I have talked about that in depth, in depth in other videos, so I am running out of space today too, so I'm not going to be going over that today. Ah. Oh shit, someone sent me 20 pounds. Oh shit. <laughs> you, all you guys are awesome. <laughs> what the hell? All right. Uh, are you still doing anything with Patreon? I recently saw, but noticed that th there I hadn't been an update in a while. Ryan, I do not really do anything on Patreon anymore. Patreon is essentially there for people that want to help support me uh, and just feel like giving a donation like every month. There's only like $1 tiers and like $5 tiers, so I don't ask anybody for anything. And I don't even ask people to sign up for it because I feel bad about like asking people to give me money. Right. So it, I, it's already like weird to me. And I know that I have to do it just because it's like uh, it's the way that I'm going to end up having to make my money now that I got laid off like a couple like three, four months ago. Well, actually, no, it's more like five months ago now. So I know that I have to push to uh, make my money that way. But I really don't want to. Like it, it, it's literally like driving me nuts because I'm like fighting the urge to do anything like that because i don't want to like i just don't want to charge people like if you guys want to like buy my books and shit like that that's a different story right you guys are more than welcome to uh, like get something from me and then in return you get something really awesome that i don't mind you guys i have put together two awesome books that will be more than like awesome choices for you guys to support me with and more to come later but i don't want you guys really like uh just giving me money just to give me money uh mostly because i i don't want that to be like the the scheme for or not not the scheme and i don't want it to be like the purpose of my channel right my purpose of my channel is to educate the purpose of this channel and these like streams that i do is not to make money like, these are for me to give back to all the people out there that have, like, made me, like, be able to complete some bucket list items because you're my fans are some of the best goddamn people in the world. Like, you guys got me into 21 Draw. You guys got me into Imagine Effects. You guys got me into Lightbox Expo. 
for fuck's sake, on the inaugural year, on the very first year it was out, you guys got me in there through force of will, right? Like, you guys emailed the people, you guys, like, did that shit without even me knowing. I just got the invite. So, without you guys, there is no me. Without me, there's going to be a lot of you guys still. So, what I like to do is I like to just give back to you guys in the way of teaching. Because this is going to be the only way that I can valuably, like, in, like, honorably be able to give back a little bit of what you guys have provided because thanks to you i'm able to be at this level if it wasn't for you guys and the ability to be able to do this a little bit more than other people thanks to the support that i get like i i wouldn't be anywhere so a lot of people ask me like why don't i just charge for my courses and i could oh i could I could charge people a decent amount of money and people would pay it. And once people are like, but that's not what I want to do. Okay. So if I do start a school, it'll be more targeted towards people that want to do it as a career. Uh, and that will be the point at, at some point to try to like target people that really want to tackle this shit, like head on instead of just learning. Like once you're done learning, like what do you do after, right? Like that's that's what I wanna tackle in my schools. Like once you have enough creative skill, how do you make yourself noticed? How do you push forth your agenda? How do you make yourself known? How do you make yourself seen? How do you approach people in real life with your art? How do you like, like drawing caricatures, for example, is a course that I've wanted to do for fucking ages. For ages. Like I've wanted because caricatures change the way that I see like the art world. Like once I learn how to do caricatures, I can honestly tell you that I will never go hungry ever again in my life. As long as I have access to a napkin and a pen. I will always have the ability to charm someone into giving me a sandwich or a dollar, right? And even though it sounds really weird, and it sounds super weird to, like, talk like that, because it sounds like, oh, someone that's just, like, feeding off the bottom of the barrel. But no, it's like, imagine that you're just guaranteed income if you wanted it. If you wanted income, you can have it. And it's... It's a it's a very interesting thing for a lot of artists to understand because we are always so limited on to how we can make our money with our artistic means. It's normally we either get hired or we end up working for somebody or we're doing somebody else's shit. Right? If it's very rare sometimes nowadays especially it's even rarer that you're making money off of your own art. So whenever you get a situation in which you can and you can, and you understand that doing that would just literally make you money, like, or get you, like, the attention of the opposite sex, or whatever you feel like accomplishing with your art. All that stuff, if you are just a tiny bit not shy, woof, it opens up the world. It opens up the entire world to you. And so many people miss that because, because they don't want to get out of their comfort zone. Or they don't want to learn something new, or they, they think it's too hard, or they're gonna you're rejected, or they're gonna think people are gonna think they're mean. They're gonna blah 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 blah. You think, 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 you think. I feel, 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 I feel. Like at one point we have to just be like, fuck it, dude. Like, is is other people's feelings gonna stop me from achieving what I want? As long as you're not hurting anybody, there's literally no reason for you to just fucking go for it. Be it, and, and it's as simple as going for it when it comes down to just drawing a person in public and giving it to them. Like, getting past that barrier is fucking hard. Like, I've taken countless people out to draw characters with me. Countless. Like, I, I used to teach people at the zoo, for fuck's sakes, right? We used to go drawing caricatures all the time. And the thing is that would stand out is the people that would have the biggest growth would always be the ones that would actively be drawing human beings and actively talking to them. 
right? Getting feedback, getting notoriety, not notoriety, but like getting validation that your art is good is always going to be good for you. So when you go out and there's like a quadrillion people going like, oh my God, this person drew us. Ah, even if they're the shittiest drawings in the world, like you'll feel good because guess what? Validation is fucking awesome. <laughs> Will this be on YouTube? Yeah, it's already streaming on YouTube, so it just it just goes there. Like I don't have to put it on YouTube. It's already on YouTube the moment that they're done. What are you using with the brush? I'm using watercolors. So I'm using like these little cheapy watercolors. And I do that so that I can create contrast so that I can enhance the parts that I wanted to teach. As opposed to it being just a blank page like this, right? If I go into this page, and now I do this, let's say I wanted to do it to this guy, right? By just adding a tiny bit of contrast, ah, keep on moving. I can make that whole character be the focal point of the piece. The whole page, now it became this guy's focal point. Oh, let's say that I wanted to add a little bit more. I want to add some cool stuff to this and then just now the eye stands out quadrillion times more. Let's do it with this girl. Let's just alternate between color and no color, right? So we go color. There's no color, but I got to contrast the face. So I add color outside. Then here's the skin as well. Then it comes down to her tattoo. So we draw some skin color there and then it comes down to her dress just by adding a tiny bit of contrast I can determine if something is light toned darker toned let's say the skirt I just don't want the skirt to be dark I want the skirt to be light right? and maybe she has socks or like leggings or something But giving myself that contrast is what allows me to be able to create more depth within my piece. In order to become a more habitual artist, somebody that draws more, somebody that like actively takes the time to spend time drawing and make that into a habit, it, all it takes is 15 minutes of your time a day. 15 minutes. If you can sit down and draw for 15 minutes in a sketchbook, it doesn't matter if you have reference or not. If you do, great. Draw something from reference. If not, look at a, a little anatomy lesson. Draw anything, anything in 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be a finished piece in 15 minutes. You can be, finish it over time, right? But getting used to those 15 minutes will eventually make you want to draw for 30 minutes. And then those 30 minutes turn into an hour. And then once you start developing that habit of drawing again, right, and making it a habit to draw at the same time every day, like I used to like to call them coffee break doodles because the reason that I call my book coffee break doodles is because the reason that I started doing this is when I had my coffee breaks, I would draw these. I would draw all my stuff during coffee breaks, right? I wouldn't teach people back then. I didn't have the confidence to do so. I didn't know my artwork was going to be like so well received by the world. Like I had a very small notoriety in the skateboarding community. Very small. Right? I did some like decks for like Earthwing and I did some decks for like other companies, you know. And I got noticed through that. So you never know where you're going to get your start to. You just never know. So you approach every possibility like it's like going to make you something. You tackle every project like if it's going to be a masterpiece. And, you know, you hope for the best in the way of your artwork standing out enough for other people to be able to notice it. I was very lucky. I was very lucky that 
uh, people enjoyed what I did in those 15 minutes of drawing. And me sharing a little bit of my life every day, right? Like, I shared my struggles. I shared, like, my problems. I had to stop doing that, doing a relationship, because um, people were going and being really mean to my to my girlfriend at the time, right? They would be overprotective, and they would, like, straight up just, like, be like send incredibly mean messages like to the point where i was like whoa like what the hell like this stranger is like commenting on our lives like they live with us holy shit like uh we need to like keep a fucking tight tab on this shit unfortunately when you get more people that follow you more people are following you and people get invested in you and people feel like they are your protectors sometimes. So you, that's like getting moderators. You know, I think I am. Uh, I have a couple people in my uh, subscriptions that are really cool and awesome people that be more than happy to do that for me. Uh, I already have some people that answer questions that are easy. Uh, they've learned from me to a point where they can answer the questions and I'm more than confident in their responses. So that's people that are helping me teach already, which is awesome. It's like like I teach someone how to do something simple and then, you know, then they can teach it and then they can help. And then another person learns how to do it and then they teach it and then they teach it how to do it. And then it helps another person out. So I have like a butterfly effect that I'm fucking loving. And I, I mean, I would love to see everybody else's work, like what they come up with, with what I teach you. But I understand that normally a teacher does not get to see that, right? Because most people, when they learn something, they, uh, they take the credit of learning it as their own, which is, is perfectly fine. You need that ego boost a lot. But as a teacher, I'm like, I can see when people have been drawing how I draw and how I teach. And then I see that. And it just lights me up. It makes me so happy. It makes me like so incredibly happy. Like, yay, they use the mask. It looks so cool. Ah, that mask looks so cool. Like, I'll get so excited and I'll have no one to share that with. That's the problem. Like, that, that's what sucks. Like, I, I just don't have the, I don't have the social network or the friends or the connections with human beings that uh, allow me to geek out like that with other humans. Like, I have learned through, like, just trial and error that my successes and my efforts are mine and mine alone. And no one's going to be as interested in what I do as I am. No one's going to be as proud of the things that I have accomplished as I am. So I stopped sharing a lot of that shit with people because... Um, no one ever got excited about the shit that I made me excited about me. So I just stopped. So now I have you guys. And you guys give me like a little soapbox to stand on to be able to like talk about my successes and stuff. And you guys don't leave. So uh, like you, I don't think you guys will ever know how thankful I am for that. And again... Another of the reasons why I give back so much to you guys. Anyways, I'm going to call it out for the day. Do, 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 do. How did you deal with not focusing on the end goal? Huh? Uh, well, I mean, I think if you're talking about the end goal of like having to deal with motivation, like I think I explained it in thorough, like how learning how to draw more in depth can help you not need this or you can straight up train it out of you by forcing yourself to draw until you have no motivation and still have to make a deadline right if you still have to make a deadline to yourself which is going to teach you self accountability as well uh then that's how you get better and that's how you get rid of motivation uh, have you ever met any big artists you always wanted to meet? I've met Sergio Aragonés, which was one of my idols. I've met Dean Eagle, which he he took my sketchbook and he wanted to steal it. 
He wanted to take my sketchbook because he thought it was a printed copy. And I was like, no, Mr. Eagle, no, you can't have my sketchbook. But then he told me to go up to his friend up across the street, across the corner on the alley and ask him if uh, they would publish my book. So I haven't reached out to them yet. I wanted to compile them together first. But uh, we might have a couple cool published books in the works soon. Uh, have to go now. Bye. Hey, no problem. See you guys later. Okay. Well, Sir Thunder, if you caught the end stream right here, I still want to thank you for coming in and checking it out. It is on YouTube. The moment that I click out of this, it normally tends to just go live right there. So you guys can always check this out later. Share it with your friends if it's something that was interesting and something that you learned. And if you guys do feel inclined to help out or reach out and support the cause that I want to achieve, there are books for you guys to buy in my links in my Instagram store. So in my links Instagram bio. So if you guys feel inclined to, great. There's free activity books for you guys too. If you guys feel like you just want to get something cool with my branding on it, you guys can check that out for free. And, you know, thank you guys so much for checking in. Love you guys all. And I'll see you guys probably tomorrow morning with another lesson. Okay? Talk to you later.